we, we met at a point of time where I was quite dis, uh, a little bit disillusioned with higher education for reasons we'll go into later. And I had just resigned from NUS and I made up my mind. Just resigned. Just, just, just like literally, just, 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 literally resigned. just resigned. And I met this guy at a SIM, UniSIM uh, presentation. And we were, wa uh, we were waiting to be interviewed by the Straits Times. And this guy came up with many, many compelling points of view. And then um, he says, I hit on him. So I asked him out, you know, and I said, uh, by the way, Ben, th these, these are my first date pants. Oh. Do you remember them? Uh, I'm, I'm, I was trying not to look down. So I I'm trying, you know, <laughs> Complex to be polite. Problem solving. So, um, and, and we had this great dinner where we discussed essentially what the, the future of education should look like according to two people who have never been trained in education <laughs> whatsoever and came from the corporate world. The liberal arts fundamentally mean the teaching of transferable practical skills. As practical knowledge is what Jeff uh, Franklin called it. Useful knowledge is what Jefferson called it. Mm -hmm. And universities don't, don't teach practical knowledge. They teach, teach subject matter knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I made that, I kind of came to that relation through this course my freshman year of college, which was not really the point of this course. And I was a little bit horrified because if the entire source of our ability to have liberty, to be able to self-govern, to be able to transfer careers from one place to another is dependent on our ability to be educated systematically, and our universities do not do that, what does that mean for the fate of the world? And so that was really the original impetus for how to, f for why I wanted to fix higher education. Yeah, and it's really interesting because um, like you, I came to higher education as an outsider, and I realized very quickly that this is a very different animal. When I was in investment banking, I worked with companies of every single sector, but this is a different sort of structure. The tools that work normally, greed, fear, money, you know, all these sort of things, uh, they don't work in the university environment, those incentives. Other things like, you know, leaders, in the corporate world, people want to be leaders. In the universities, it's like, oh my goodness, please don't ask me to do national service. They don't, the leaders, the deanery, they don't get paid more than much more. They don't get to do their research. Uh, they get much more administrative duties. So for, for leaders in the, the university world, they don't, simply don't function according to the rules uh, of the corporate world. And uh, I think, Ben, you put it best. Uh, how did you put it? Like, you learned that students don't. Yeah, well, I mean, I, when I tried to reform my university, when I had this epiphany, uh, I spent four years trying to fix the university I went to. And I realized students don't go to university to learn. Professors don't go there to teach. And administrators neither care about learning or teaching. Nor teaching. Um, and so that creates a bit of a problem when you try to reform the educational mission of the university. And what you said, Ben, that really struck me was that, that universities only have one currency, yeah. and that currency is? Well, it's prestige. And this is something which is really hard for people to understand. When we think of pretty much any enterprise you know, the focus is money. Right? Corporations exist to generate profits. Nonprofits exist to relieve people of their money so that they can operate. Um, money is at the heart of pretty much every enterprise we know. If I were to go to any university and I would be able to tell them, I'm going to give you um, one of two things. I'm going to give you a billion dollar gift right? that you have to use to build nice buildings and fancy parking lots and things like that. You can't use it for hiring people. Or I can add five Nobel Prize winners to your staff for which you will have to raise an additional $50 million a year. A hundred percent of universities around the world will choose the latter. A hundred percent. right? Because universities not only chase prestige, 
I'm actually in Singapore because I was invited here to speak at a conference by one of the ranking groups that unveiled rankings and showed, oh, here's this university that's one point higher than that university, and you know how important. But the people who make up universities, professors, are obsessed with prestige. They're, the entire determination of their career is related to prestige. What journals did you publish in? Do you have tenure? Are you an associate professor? Are you a full professor? And so the prestige of institutions is their currency. And therefore, when you pay your school fees to come to university, you're not paying. It doesn't do what it says on the box. You're not paying to get somebody to give you a quality education, mostly, and how to prepare you for the real world. A lot of the case, uh, a lot of the, in, uh, of the times that your school fees are going towards supporting research because the best professors are very interested in publishing their own research and very uninterested in teaching students. So, you know, it, it was, that, that was quite a shocking experience for me. And that also means that the people teaching our youth of today are perhaps the least equipped people to steward our youth into the future. This future, this VUCA world as we know it, where they're going to need broad general skills, things like, you know, awareness, self-awareness, intuition, you know, resilience, empathy, for example. Sometimes, uh, you know, the, these uh, skills are extremely rare in a university context. So just to give you a, a small um, anecdote, um, when I was in the university, I decided to conduct a, a thought experiment. So we had 25 workshops in a row of freshman students. And we decided that at the start of each workshop, um, I or one of my teachers would stand in front of the room and hold up a $50 bill. And we would say, uh, anybody who wants to take this bill can come up to the front of the class, just take it. So here's what happened. Typical situation, I'd stand there, I'd hold out the bill, stunned silence. People would start looking at each other, people would start whispering, nudging each other, and I would just stand and I would just wait. Finally, after a few minutes, invariably, one student would peel himself, and I say himself because it was always a male. There was one time it was a female, she stood up, and then when she saw another guy stand up, she, she, she sat back down. So, Another problem. So anyway, invariably, there will be a male student who peels himself away from the crowd and comes up to the front of the room and kind of gingerly takes this bill and then runs back to cheers from the audience. And then after that, I'll ask my students, so what's, what got in the way? What got in the way of you coming up to the class and taking that bill? Now, it's not a skill. You know, it's not a skill issue. Anybody has the cap capacity to stand up and walk and take that bill. But the answers they gave were really fascinating. Some of them said, well, I was really skeptical. Uh, I didn't think that, it, I thought it was a trick. Some of them said, I didn't want to be laughed at. I didn't want other people to look at me. I didn't want to stand out. And some of them even told me, that uh, it wasn't enough. It was only $50. <laughs> if it had been $100, I might have gotten up, which is frankly quite sad. But interestingly, out of all these people who got up and took the bill, by far the vast majority, I would estimate 80% of the time, they were foreign students. They were from India, they were from China, etc. They were from Vietnam. Very few of them were Singaporean. So, you know, to me, I really believe it's a mindset thing. Like what gets in the way is about your belief system about the world and about yourself. When I asked the, 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 the lady who stood up, why did you sit back down? Well, I saw the other boy stand up and I thought, well, he's gonna get there faster than me. She was the same distance away, so she sat back down. So, I mean, a lot of, uh, of education to me is far deeper than just the subject, the domain expertise. Now, what's interesting is that if it takes a variety of experiences, and we know that sometimes, because we also know a lot of old fools, people don't even get wisdom with time. But in the best case scenario, somebody who's had enough experience and has their neurons firing in the right way will attain that wisdom. 
why leave it up to accident? Why just let people stumble into these problems as opposed to curate that process for them? Provide them a structure in which practical knowledge is introduced and allow them to apply it in various contexts until they see the generalizable value of it. It gets ingrained in their mind, and they can then apply it in novel ways. So can you give us an example of, you know, like, so the Minerva, sure. the Minerva curriculum, the first year curriculum is entirely teaching students hashtag 86 hashtags of habits of thinking and foundational concepts that then you expect the student to apply to any situation. Can you give us an example? Sure. Who here um, knows what a sunk cost is? Okay. All right, good, decent amount of you all do quick. That, that's a very good point, right? So you've waited for the bus, you've waited 15 minutes, you say, oh, I've already waited for the bus, and now there's somebody coming by, you know, willing to give me a free ride. You say, no, 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 you know, the bus will come anyway, you keep going. It's a complete sunk cost, it's a good example. Oh, very good. Relationships and partnerships. You've given and given and given to a partner. The partner has taken and taken and taken, not given a lot back. Partner comes back to you and says, oh, I would like some more of your time and attention. You say, well, given all the time I've given you already and returned nothing, tells me that I should ignore the investment I've already made in you because you're a worthless human being and you should leave that person. <laughs> right? So that is exactly right. Right now, this is an act, and a great, uh, two great examples, because the first example is what we refer to as near transfer. Right, it is a and a certain amount of resource. Right, in the first case it was money, in the second case it was time that you have invested in a transaction. Right, it requires additional investment of resource. Relationships is, is now a, an example of far transfer, right? Uh, the nature of uh, an example which is quite different, right? Economists that usually learn about sunk costs turn out do not have a better history of relationships than non-economists. Uh, it turns out that there's no correlation between the two. Um, even though economists should be, be able to understand sunk costs in an intuitive way, and walk away from bad relationships. But making that connection isn't natural for most people. Which is why professors who are very, very good at their field yeah. often you know, are very good at the, the critical thinking in their silo, exactly. but they cannot connect those habits and those foundational concepts to anything outside of, of their silo thinking, yeah. right? Exactly. So if you want to teach foundational concepts, in a broad way, you will introduce a foundational concept like sunk cost. It takes two minutes to, to teach. But then you will use examples in business, in personal interaction, in uh, uh, transportation, was a good one, uh, in biological systems. Because sunk costs, like almost all the habits and concepts that we teach, are near universal. You can actually see them underpinning the various systems in which we live formal systems that we live, logic and reasoning and the world of data, things that are often related and associated with critical thinking, empirical systems, the observed world, where you have ill-structured data and you have to figure out what kinds of conclusions you can make from the ill-structured data that you're presented with, which is otherwise known as creative thinking or problem solving. Right? The world of complex systems, which is actual, the reality that we live in, Right, where you have emergent properties, second and third order effects, unintended consequences, all of those things that govern our day-to-day -day lives, right? these invisible forces around us. Uh, they're not really forces, but they're emergent properties of the biological, economic, market-based systems, political systems, societal systems that we all live in. And the abstract realities of our relationships, the rhetorical systems, how we communicate with each other. Um, so if you understand critical thinking, creative thinking, 
effective interactions and effective communications and the component parts there of them in a transferable way, you become a wise person. And that's what we teach.